All right, so we're live now. Hello and assalamu alaikum to all viewers. Thank you for joining us on the second day. After the success of the first day, uh, we're back with Dr. Kashif Hafiz. Dr. Kashif Hafiz is going to be speaking on control in the dental world, roadmap to better cross-infection prevention. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Kashif Hafiz. He is currently serving as the Honorary Clinical Teaching Fellow at the University College London, Eastman Dental Institute. He also has a lot of other qualifications. Uh, unfortunately, the qualifications were so many, we couldn't really fit them into the space here that we will soon see. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Kashif now. And uh, Dr. Kashif, you have 40 minutes for this session. Okay, good luck perfect, thank you perfect. thank you very much thank you so guys uh, good morning uh, thanks for giving me time to uh, on a sunday uh, morning i think it must be afternoon in pakistan can you see my screen and can you hear me well okay i assume yes if i'm interrupted i i, I know that i've not been heard well so uh, guys we're gonna uh, talk about infection prevention and control uh, it's a very uh, essential topic and uh, the things I'm going to tell you in this presentation is I'm not going to teach you infection prevention and control. You are hopefully all dentists and the, the students who are uh, listening to this talk as well. They should know what infection prevention and control is. This is like ABC of dentistry. You should not be allowed in the clinic area area if you do not know about infection prevention and control so i'm not going to teach you uh, what is infection prevention and control although i'm going to tell you what we do he here in in england and how do we do uh, the infection prevention and control in england that's the aim, main aim of uh, today's talk and i am uh, I'm not an expert in infection prevention and control. I'm just going to share my experience, our experience with yourself. So uh, please uh, take whatever you want to from this uh, presentation. And uh, I know it's it's sometimes the things can be too uh, expensive for uh, you to get, or sometimes difficult for you to get all the things in your practices. But my opinion or my suggestion, humble suggestion, I would want to say is that you should start from somewhere so that is uh, the message and uh, we're going to talk about infection prevention and control and uh, i will i'll be followed by christian which is going to talk about the technical details of uh, infection prevention and control although i'm going to i'm going to be very much practical very much clinical and he can talk about the technical side of things which of course he knows better than me so uh, a bit about myself, who the people who don't know me, I'm a dental ambassador for Southwest England Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh. I'm an honorary clinical teaching fellow for University College London Eastman Dental Institute, uh, and I'm involved in their uh, training programs. Uh, I have, have done my graduation very proudly from uh, Pakistan. I am a member of Royal College of Surgeons Ireland. I'm a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons Ireland. I'm a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons Edinburgh. I have done my uh, PG cert in medical education uh, from Oxford, and I love teaching and training. We do quite a lot of mentoring as well, and uh, I have done fellowship from the Faculty of Dental Trainers, Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh, and uh, we do quite a lot of mentoring and coaching uh, in England and abroad as well. So uh, if you guys are interested in uh, learning the first-hand experience, then uh, I will have my email at the end and you can Facebook me, Insta me, whatever, and we can talk about it, but I'm not gonna waste too much of your time. This is one of uh, my Oxford practice, one of the practices I have got in England. Uh, it's, it's in a very nice town, which is in West Oxfordshire. So if you guys have heard of Cotswold, we are in Cotswold, it's a beautiful, beautiful countryside. So let me uh, tell you about infection prevention and control. You alone cannot 
achieve infection prevention and control in your practice. You have to have your team involved. You have to train your team. You have to keep them up to date, up to the mark, because you alone are too much busy in your clinical practice, managing patients, managing patients' expectations, doing their clinical work, and that's what you are trained to do. But if you're going to also be responsible for infection control, which indirectly you are, but if you're going to be responsible for infection control directly, then it's going to be you've got too much on your plate. So I would say this is the area in practicing dentistry where you have to involve your team. It's a team effort and it has to be uh, the team has to be updated. They have to be trained very well. And it's all about the teamwork that you're going to achieve effective infection prevention and control in your practice. Uh, we do oftenly get together, me and my team, uh, for uh, meals and uh, going out. So um, they are quite well trained, well updated with the infection control protocols. And without them, I will, I cannot or I will not be able to achieve infection prevention and control. This gives you a, a, a sort of picture that how you are going to, as your head of the practice, how you are going to trickle down the training in, the, in your team and how you're going to keep them updated. So that is a question that should arise in your mind at this point of time. So you need to have a plan for that. You need to plan that your team should be up to date infection control. Now, the, I'm going to tell you about what normal infection control and prevention protocol we have got. And I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID afterwards. The reason I'm saying little bit is there is so much information about COVID on social media. We are bombarded by information. Everybody in this world who's living in the dental world would know about what to do, what's a respirator, what's a FFP3, what's a P3. So you know these things. That's why I've kept it to very minimal. And that's the whole beauty of media and social media that you get to know the things instantly even you do not leave the house. So uh, that's why I'm going to keep it very uh, minimal. And I'm going to talk to you about the normal infection uh, prevention we do in our practices, not specifically COVID, because there's quite a lot of information already about that. So we start with a thorough medical history. So now you need to know which kind of patients you are getting in your practice. Although we use universal precautions, but you still need to know about the medical history of the patient. And that should be very thorough. That should be updated every time the patient is in your practice. So that is a requirement you should have. It's not that the patient has done a medical history form six years back and you have not updated it. You have to keep it updated every time the patient comes in. In here, there's a trend or there is a prevalence of getting the signatures from the patient every time they come in on their medical history. So next time they cannot come back to you and say, oh, I had this or you have given me penicillin antibiotics and I was I had allergic to penicillin and I've developed it in the last one year. So every time the patient comes in, they update their medical history. Again, as uh, yesterday, I was pretty much on basics. Today, I'm going to be pretty much on basics because I think that, yes, I can show you chin block graphs. I can show you ridge splits. But if we do not have got the basics right, then there is no use of building uh, tall buildings on that. It is unethical for you to you refuse a dental, dental care to your patients. So you cannot say no to your patients that if they are HIV or if they are HEP B positive or if they have got COVID, that you know going to, well, COVID is a different uh, scenario at the moment, but HIV or HEP B, you cannot say no to your patients that, oh, I'm gonna, not going to see you because you are HIV positive or you're going to make an excuse. That is not allowed. You actually declared or you promised to treat everybody equally, to see all your patients, to do the service to humanity when you signed up for your graduation program.
So you should know about it. You need to treat everybody fairly. Confidentiality is a very big issue in England and all the medical history, all the patient notes have to be confidential with yourself and your practice. It's need to know basis. If you do not need to know the information, you shouldn't get it. It's and it has been tightened quite a lot with GDPR, the new the European uh, dental protection, uh, data protection laws. And even so much so that we cannot send group emails. We cannot send any information other to anybody apart from the patient itself. And even we cannot leave voicemail messages on the patient landline. Because if the patient is living with uh, an adult son or uh, a partner, the partner, if the patient does not want, the partner should not know about the medical history or any information. So if we want to leave a voicemail message, then we have to have written consent or at least verbal consent from the patient that patient has authorized us to leave the voicemail messages on landline. We are so strict on that. And that's why the patients have got trust that their information is safe with us. So I'm not saying start doing it. As I already said early in the lecture, you need to start somewhere. We need to start somewhere. That is very important. Every practice should have an infection control policy. Every practice should train their staff in infection control. And that is, again, very essential and that has to be updated and every staff has got a specific role in infection control so that is again bringing whole of the team together whole of the team forward to achieve the best possible infection control in your practices you need to start thinking because of covid there may be some surgery design changes so you need to think about your surgery design if you guys are going to make the uh, the listeners who are uh, in final year graduation, you will be making your new practices. Start thinking on the design now. The surgery has to be properly designed. The, uh, the right choice of equipment is very important as well. You need to do a bit of research. Economy, finances should not be the only deciding factor. That is important. Wherever possible, use single-use disposable items, and that is recommended. Reusable instruments, uh, they, they have to be properly sterilized, and uh, uh, they, uh, you should be aware of the information regarding what you do with endophiles. So uh, they, they are not, they're not reused. They are single-use. Systemic approach for decontamination processes uh we'll go through the flow chart in a bit and uh pre sterilizer cleaning guys this is very important in this in, uh, cross infection and disinfection how effectively you are cleaning your instruments before they go to sterilization thinking in your head that sterilizer is gonna take care of each and every bug if you're gonna roast or cook the item at 134 degrees, it's gonna resolve the problem. This is not right. The instruments have to be clean properly in order for the sterilization to work. If you've got cement attached to your instrument, no matter you, you roast it to 1000 degrees, the cement may disintegrate and then come away, but still there will be parts of instruments that's not going to be sterilized. So please make sure that pre-sterilization cleaning is done properly. Your staff has to be trained, very well trained in there. That's the, that's the thing that your staff has to make sure that's done right. How are you dispatching your impressions to the laboratory? Because from your dental clinic, the, the impressions should not go into uh, the laboratory or infection with impression should not go into the laboratory. So you need to have proper policy for decontamination of impressions. And that should be uh, the, the disinfectants and the manufacturing instructions should be followed 
strictly. Surface de decontamination, you need to think about what are the surfaces which are exposed, especially with this COVID and AGP. It is very important that you do the surface decontamination properly. Uh, dental unit water line. So now you need to start thinking about what happened to your water lines, the pipes which bring the water in your handpiece. What happened to those pipes or lines when your surgery was shut down for the last three months? What would have happened in those water lines? You need to start thinking of it. Legionella is a very big risk. So you need to think about how you're going to get rid or how can you be sure that your practice is taking precautions for Legionella. That is very important. Your patient need to have trust that I'm walking into this practice. I'm not going to go out with having a Legionella disease. So this is, uh, this is what you should be thinking at, that what you should do or what you would have done to clean your water lines. They should be uh, fitted with anti-retraction walls, should be flushed for two minutes at the beginning of the day and 20 to 30 seconds between patients. So that is, again, uh, the normal uh, protocol will follow. Water bottles, have you uh, removed the water bottles or are they removed uh, at the end of the day, uh, left to dry overnight and stored inverted? Is the, this being followed in your practice? You need to look into it. So that's why I said earlier, you cannot do everything by yourself. You have to have your staff trained. You have to have a checklist in your practice which stays, which says that this is the things that needs to be done at the end of the day. This is the things that needs to be done at the beginning of the day. We have those checklists uh, posted in our practices and we have the, the staff member who is assisting in our surgeries completing that checklist and signing it at the end of the day. So we know that all the protocols were followed during that day and this, this staff member has actually checked it. So if there is any problem on that day, that staff member can be held accountable. But you cannot use your, uh, uh, use your discretion of uh, getting them accountable if you're not trained them. So you need to first train them in order for them to be accountable. And at the same time, you are accountable as well. There's no one in dental world who does not answer questions. Dipside culture, slide coated with agar medium and incubated. So that is another test you can do to see how clean your surgeries are. Clinical waste, I, 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 I visit Pakistan regularly, so I'm not very sort of uh, alien to Pakistan. And uh, my colleagues and friends who are, who are listening must uh, second that, that. I visit Pakistan regularly more than anybody else who's living abroad. So I, uh, I assume that there is a policy for clinical waste. There was a huge uh, thing about it, and that has been taken care of. But that has to be maintained. So every time, for example, the clinical waste can be tracked, can be traced to you. If something happens in that clinical waste, that can be done. For example, a clinical waste person is carrying your clinical waste and your staff member has accidentally threw a sharp in your clinical waste. The clinical waste handler gets the prick. So that prick, he can then trace it back to your practice. This is how it should be done. And that way you can trace it back to the day which where that clinical waste bag was compiled or assembled and that way you can uh, hold held responsible that staff can be held responsible so that's where how the tracing is going to be done that's where the tracing should be done there are tags available which you can put to the clinical waste and that, that those tags can be scanned and can be traced 
I'm not again, please, I'm not again suggesting that all these things should be done, but you need to stop thinking after this lecture how you're going to get close to these things as uh, quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. I know Pakistan um, have got different ground reality and I'm very much aware of it, but please, we need to start somewhere. Blood spillage, what is your protocol, clinic protocol for actually having blood spillage on the floor? If you have taken a tooth out, you put the gauze or the tooth falls on the floor with blood with on it, the floor gets dirty, the blood is on the floor. So what's your clinic policy to deal with that blood stain or deal with that blood spillage? So this is the policy we follow. So the, this should be the, the the staff should be trained in that, and staff should be uh, very much aware of what they're going to do if they have got that blood spillage. Immunization of the staff should be uh, a record should be kept that all the staff is immunized and uh, they have been immunized against uh, the diseases, so that they are then allowed to come into uh, the practice or the clinical area. There are uh, some staff members who unfortunately cannot um, uh, get 100% evidence for that immunity and that those staff members should be kept away from the clinical area. So those staff, staff members should be handling the reception. So you need to think on those lines. Uh, hand hygiene, quite a lot has been said about hand hygiene, quite a lot has been done about hand hygiene, but your staff members should know all the three different types of hand hygiene we, we do. Uh, and uh, if we do the indication of these kind of uh, hand washing for different procedures. So uh, that should be again, should be in a, in a, in a, in a form of uh, animated uh, pictures and that should be paste, uh, posted near the wash basin or where your staff wash your hands. Uh, eye protection, face mask again, uh, due to COVID, that is uh, quite essential now. Surgery clothing, aerosol, and blood splitter. Uh, emerging infections, we are uh, we are challenged by COVID nineteen nowadays. Uh, previously, CJD was a very big thing. MRSA again is again very big thing in hospitals and uh, teaching institutions. Tuberculosis, herpes, influenza, which actually, unfortunately, is 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 recurring and uh, keeps challenging us every uh, now and then. Uh, we follow HTM 0105, which is a health technical memorandum, which was published by the Department of Health in England, and that is our bible for cross infection. So, guys, please, if you go. Uh, if you can Google it and uh, download it and keep it uh, as uh, the basic um, guideline or protocol for your practices, please do that because this is a free downloadable PDF file. So you don't uh, have to uh, look into other stuff for each and everything. You just take uh, this uh, book and or, or uh, just save it electronically and refer to it whenever it's needed. Uh, CJD again was a very uh, big thing we have pre experienced previously and uh, now as well. But again, the stress has to be here about the decontamination before sterilization. That is very important. As we know, COVID hates soap as well. So again, decontamination will take care of most of the stuff anyway. And then you do your sterilization. So please make sure that your decontamination protocol in your practices is followed properly. Now, in, in England, uh, the compliance to this document is achieved by, two, by grading the practices into two categories. Number one category is essential quality requirement, which is, as the name suggests, this is essential. Without this, your practice cannot open or your practice cannot stay open. The practice has to be closed if they do not follow the essential quality requirements. And the other one is best practice, which means everything is done according to the book and at a higher standard. So 
in order for your practice to be open, you need to follow the essential quality requirement and you can be a best practice as well. Now, as we know, things do not stop at essential quality requirement. Your aim should be to be, have to be best practice. So the practices who are fulfilling essential quality requirements should have a plan to become the best practice. So the ultimate aim is to be the best practice, but you can still keep on working with a plan to be the best practice. That is, again, mandatory. So it's, we, we do not stop at being essential quality requirement practice. It has to be best, best practice. What are the things that will make it uh, essential uh, quality requirements? Uh, cleaning of instruments uh, should be free of visible uh, contaminants. Now, you need to start thinking on that terms that how you can be sure that they are free of visible contaminants. How sure we have been that they are free from all the visible contaminants. Well, visibility is, uh, again, different for different people. If I look at it without my glasses, I may be blind as a bat. So visibility has to be uh, has to be quali uh, qualitatively controlled. So, which means that visibility should be visible, and that is, uh, I would say, the minimal requirement you can achieve is getting a magnifying glass next to the sink where your staff is cleaning the instruments so they can have a look at the magnifying glass and through that magnifying glass they can see whether their instruments are clean or not and that magnifying glass you must have seen uh, in and on uh, with the with the watch uh, repairers they've got a magnifying glass attached to the table and you can have a magnifying glass as well so that way you can be sure that they are free from visible visible contaminants because naked eye you can still leave uh, the stuff. So validated sterilization, that is again important. For example, if you have sterilized an instrument and the patient comes to you after six months claiming that he has got the hepatitis or HIV from your practice, that is that you should have a validation that you can show to the patient, say, no, your instruments were sterilized properly. So please knock on somebody else's door, not our door. So that is validated sterilization. That is what you need to achieve. Storage, you need to start thinking about where you're storing your instruments after your sterilization and quarterly audit. Um, and that is, again, very important that you need to audit your staff member, yourself, the way of cleaning, the way of sterilization, how records are going to be met. All these things need to be audited. Otherwise, you may be thinking that you're doing things properly, but it, your problem may not be proper to the remaining or remaining world. So they have to be audited. Uh, this is again, as it's, you must be familiar with this picture. You need to uh, keep record of your sterilization, the proof of sterilization, so that whenever there's a problem, you will show to the authorities that this is the instruments were sterilized properly. You can have printer attached to your uh, uh, sterilizer as well, or now there's a USB. You can all that that data is stored electronically. Uh, you should have a surgical po cross infection policy, a protocol for decontamination, storage protocol, and procedure or protocol for single use and reusable instruments. Reprocessing of instruments should be uh, done with a dedicated equipment. I think um, Christian is going to go through the detail of uh, the different technical part of this uh, instruments, uh, cleaning and equipment. Dedicated hand washing facilities. Uh, practices can use ultrasonic baths as well to meet the essential quality requirements. This is essential quality requirements we're talking about. And separation of instrument processing from clinical work. So processing of instruments is done separately. Everybody must be knowing about ultrasonic cleaner. They have to be maintained as well. They have to be kept up to date as well. And there is a way you can uh, keep checking your ultrasonic cleaners. I think we do not have time to go to 
minute details, but uh, there is a way. Uh, sterilizer, you guys are familiar with sterilizer, you know much, much better than myself. So which type of sterilizer are, are there? Uh, the essential quality requirement will tell you that there are different processing zones. And so the, the, the processing area is divided into dirty zone and clean zone. Um, you need to know the ventilation input as well. The ventilation or the air is going to come from clean zone and go out from the dirty zone. It cannot be the other way around. And uh, so the instruments come in, they are delivered, they are clean, they are put in the ultrasonic cleaner, they are put in the rinsing sink, they are put in the sterilizer afterwards, they are inspected and stored and they go out. This is the instrument flow and the airflow is uh, shown by the blue arrows. So this is how your instrument flow should be to achieve proper uh, disinfection and sterilization. Appropriate control of disposable waste and documented training protocols. So your, doc, uh, your training staff training should be documented. Immunization, we have already discussed and note that there are two dedicated sinks for decontamination in addition to the dedicated sink for hand washing. So there are multiple sinks here. You cannot, you're not using the same hand washing sink to, for decontamination. So uh, you need to decide whether you're going to pack the instruments. You're not going to. Uh, you are if if you're going to pack, how uh, much they're going to be stored for, and what is your protocol for the flow of instruments? Quarterly audits are essential. This is the picture of storage of instruments. You guys must be familiar of that. They should be stored away from the splatter, free from the aerosol, and safe from the aerosol. Uh, this is um, the flow of instruments so and that is a uh, reprocessing an instrument so disinfectant if the washer disinfector is used reinspect steam sterilized package store for 21 days use transport and then that's the cycle is completed and that's the other way if uh, you are not using uh, if if uh, the different type of sterilizer are using so the different sterilizers have got different flow charts so again, uh, all the policies should be there. Uh, decontamination policy, hand hygiene policy, clinical waste policy, decontamination of instruments policy. And this is how your sink should be without any joints and there should not be any joints where bugs can stay and uh, can grow. So automatic uh, tap. Spillage of products, you, uh, staff should be aware of what would happen if they uh, spill the, pro, uh, the, the the different products on the floor. Documented training scheme should be there and individual staff training documents should be kept. And that's the storage of instruments uh, after the different sterilizers. So best practice is to achieve higher standards in infection control through improvement in premises equipment. So this is the higher standard, but we should aim to have the best practice. So this is with washer disinfector installed, and that will take care of the decontamination. This is the water disinfector in fact, is shown, and this is the cycle of washer disinfector, how it disinfects the uh, instruments. And that is the same flow with the um addition of washer disinfector so the flow is the same everything is the same but in this best practice the washer disinfector is added some have gone to even more lengths so, uh, they have got separate rooms for clean and dirty so they have got a partition in between so that is a uh, Pretty much, uh, this is what we do normally, but you can see that there are quite a lot of policies and guidance involved, and that you should be aware of that. Now, with COVID-19, I'm just going to whiz through uh, these slides because these slides, you must have seen these slides or these pictures 100 times. So you should be very much aware, your staff should be very much aware of what kind of PPE they will require to work. They should be very much trained. They should be very much clear. And if you as practice owners cannot provide them PPE, then you should be answerable. They should question you that this is the standard protocol, why I'm not giving given the proper PPE. 
Uh, this is uh, a very good uh, visual guide. Uh, guys, these uh, pictures, they, they are, you can go to Public Health England website and you can download them. Please print them and post them in your practices so everybody knows what they should be wearing for which procedure and they should be very clear. Uh, hand hygiene, again, uh, this is again a downloadable uh, document or a picture from Public Health England website. You can, you should print this and place it next to the washing uh, sink so that people know what, uh, how should they wash their hands. Uh, again, FFP3 and uh, facial hair is uh, a debate. Uh, this is a recommendation that what, uh, what kind of uh, uh, facial hair you can have and which is acceptable with FFP3. Uh, I'm not I'm not suggesting anything. I'm just leaving it open for you to decide. That is, uh, this is the, the 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 protocol we are following here. Putting the uh, gown on and taking it off. There is protocol. There is a proper flow for uh, the, these uh, putting the gowns on and off. So how do you take it off? How do you put it on? So there is pro proper protocol for uh, um, taking it off. Uh, I want you to have uh, note this, take a picture of this slide. This is the doning and doffing of PP for AGPs. You can uh, show it, uh, you can see it on YouTube. So that will very much uh, clear any doubts which have, you've got in your mind. You can just literally send the links to your staff members as well so that they can have a look at it. So you can take a picture of that. If you want uh, further in, in, or you want me to send the slide, uh, I will just email me. Uh, this is the uh, practice we, uh, another practice, uh, I, I, I place implants in Oxfordshire. You can see that this has got a screen on the roof for the patients to see. And we had to fight with the council quite a lot to get this steel, steel, uh, screen installed because they, wanted us to be very sure that it is very secure and people who have visited england would know that every wall is made up of cardboard so we had to struggle quite a bit i'll go into detail some other time uh that's the, the the problem with this practice was this has got only one door to go in and go out and as we discussed that there should be two separate ways for going the dirty instruments go out and cleaning instruments to come in so that was a challenge for us to uh to go around it because it has only one door so the, the way we went around is that we have uh, put this shoot system. So this shoot system is a one-way uh, shoot system. The instruments are clean here. They are packed in uh, a plastic bottle and they, are sh they, they were sent through vacuum to the sterilizer room. So you guys have to think laterally. To, to, you don't have to change everything, but you have to think laterally to include changes in your practices how can this be worked out uh, i'm here to uh, be approached i'm quite approachable if you've got any problems you want solutions you want lateral thinking you want some guidance email me and we can surely uh, sort the things out uh, there's quite a lot of controversies with uh, this covid has created uh, fellow time is a big one how much time you're going to allow uh, between patients, if you're following AGP, what you are going to do for exhalation, uh, in, if you're using FFP3 mask, uh, a powered air purifying respirator, the hoods, are you going to use them? How they're going to be kept clean? How they're going to be maintained? Uh, if the patient comes up, comes back and say that they have been infected at your surgery, what you're going to do? And uh, there may be staff members who are more prone to risk than other staff members. So how are you going to uh, segregate them? Uh, we are bombarded with information and you, I believe you me, every time you hear something new. I've got uh, some suggestions. I would not use the word recommendations because uh, I'm not I'm not I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm just like you. So I will have some suggestions for IPAC. IPAC should help deciding the policies and protocols uh, for dentists. And I think PDA should, should collaborate with IPAC to develop these protocols and policies. If you need my help, I'm available, I'm approachable. So just ask me and we can together form some policies and protocols. I think it's about time that we, we start 
uh, giving reward to the practices who are following the full protocol. So something like best practices for the practices who are following full protocols on these policies. Staff training and validation. If you are making policies, then IPAC should keep an eye on the staff members training as well and should arrange uh, staff training and validation as well. Uh, PDA should have essential CME hours for infection control every time the, pay, uh, the, the, the professional comes in for renewing their uh, membership or P, uh, 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 the, C, uh, the P, PMDC membership, they should show the, the essential CME hours for essential control like you do it in CPSP. Uh, I think uh, the institutions, dental institutions should be uh, given the, the power to the house officers to actually do the reflections on cross-infection control when they are doing the house job. That way, they can get uh, picked up with some uh, shortcomings. I think the key opinion leaders, the practices who are doing very well, uh, the, the panelists should come forward for opening up their practices to open visits so that the kid, uh, so that the newcomers can come in, so anybody can come and see what uh, sort of infection control we are having and they can learn from it. Audits and reporting should be done quite regularly and you need to audit yourself in order to see what uh, you're doing and how well you're doing. Thank you very much. And these are my uh, email addresses. Please email me if you want uh, any any questions any concerns you've got and please email me and thank you very much for giving me time on this sunday thank you very much thank you very much dr kashif it was indeed a very informative session and thank you for the suggestions you gave at the end we hope we can implement thank these you. suggestions and overall improve infection prevention and control protocols in pakistan all right thank you, thank you. for everyone who's watching uh, the next session, we'll move on to the next session now. Uh, hello and welcome to Mr. Christian Stemp. Hello. My name is Aisha Rehan and I am the president of VFOT National Council and I will be the host for this session. Mr. Stemp will be speaking on the infection prevention and control in the dental world, a uh, roadmap to better cross infection prevention. And a little bit about Mr. Christian Stemp. He's the uh, hygiene advisor for the WNH group. Mr. Stemp, you have 40 minutes for this lecture. I'll hand over the lecture to you now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. And I'm very pleased um, being a part of your, of your project. And um, sorry. Okay, who am I? As you said, I'm the uh, hygiene advisor to the WNH group, uh, but more important, uh, I've experienced over 30 years in this dental world and dental industry. Um, and very soon I joined the European Committee for Normalization, for Standardization. Uh, this is a technical committee, uh, basically um, regarding reprocessing, and I'm following very strictly, deeply working group five, which regards steam sterilizers, and working group eight, thermal washer disinfectors. <clears throat> and I provide lectures on infection prevention all over the world to uh, healthcare professionals, and also dedicate most of my time to train dental assistants. Uh, I'm from France. And in my country, for example, now the doctors are obliged to have a trained uh, certified nurse. So when it comes to reprocessing and infection prevention, um, they call a stabunage. So it's a very, it's a three hour full course. So you can imagine that in 45 minutes, it's going to be very, <laughs> very brief. And uh, technically, I'm an engineer. I co-designed a very high end steam sterilizer. So I know what steam is about and what sterilization is all about. So when I was invited, I thought, what I'm going to talk about, and this is the agenda, a small introduction on microbiology, very simple, to understand the um, infectiousness of these bacteria and viruses, the resistance, so we better know how to, to kill them or to inactivate them when it comes to viruses. Uh, I want to really scare you in the good sense that you doctors are very exposed, the number one exposed to airborne infections or infections in, uh, in general. And um, I lectured a couple of months ago on reprocessing masks, which is not the usual procedure, 
but I've learned a lot on face masks, and this I want to share with you. There might be, of course, some repetitions which has, with what has been said before or yesterday uh, regarding hand hygiene, but uh, I mean, you take maybe some good points, and half of my presentation regards reprocessing. I know it has been said before, but I want to show some pictures and insist on a couple of things which are really indispensable to achieve sterilization. That's the focus in the end, how to achieve proper sterilization. So let's get started on uh, bacteria. You know, bacteria um, within a very nice medium, they grow, replicate, uh, this is an asexual reduction, so by themselves, a bacteria uh, will grow here to a fixed size and starts to split into two daughter cells. What you see here, this is the DNA, the genetic information of the bacteria. So nowadays, we talk about uh, proving that you do things right, that your procedures are up to date. Be aware that uh, with the DNA, it can be proven that uh, with some samples that one doctor might have infected a certain patient. So there are ways to prove it. So this is quite fast, the video, but basically every 20 to 30 minutes, given, given good conditions, um, a bacteria will replicate. So you have two, then after one hour, you have four, eight, 16, 32, and very quickly, it ends up to millions after overnight. This is why instruments must be processed uh, end of the day. You cannot wait the day after because uh, they are more, the um, microbial load is much higher. And in this case, we might not lead to achieve uh, sterilization. Viruses, to the contrary of bacteria, because most of them are very good to humans, actually we could not live without uh, bacteria, but viruses, they are all born to kill. Actually, this comes from the Latin poison. Viruses are poisonous, they kill us, okay? And they are much smaller than a bacteria, and there's a good reason for that, because they cannot replicate like a bacteria. They need to penetrate, to enter a host cell, okay, to replicate. So they will use the metabolism, the system, the technology of the host cell to replicate, to grow, to multiply. This is the video. You see here, the first thing will be attachment. So the, uh, if you talk about COVID, if you look for uh, lungs, no? So it will penetrate inside the host cell, uncodes, replicates, reassemble, and then release the new virus. And every little virus, new virus, will go to the next cell and do the same thing. This is called the incubation time until you, you get in troubles, into troubles and uh, into um, infections. There are two types of viruses. These are called the naked or non-enveloped viruses, and these are the enveloped viruses. The bones have also the DNA or RNA. This depends on the nucleic acid, but it's basically the, the genes of the, uh, of the virus, protected by this protein code surrounding the genes. And then for the enveloped viruses, you have this lipidic envelope um, around the, uh, the virus. So these enveloped viruses are the worst. You find all the worst, including COVID, you know, HIV, hepatitis B, C, Ebola, herpes. These enveloped viruses are really the, the worst. Now, the good news, and that's the purpose of my introduction, when it comes to resistance, they are the weakest, they are fragile. It doesn't mean that uh, they will die by themselves, okay, after a certain time, yes, but when it comes to reprocessing, we have to do something to, uh, in this case, to inactivate viruses. This is the good news. On top, we have uh, vegetative bacteria, you have fungi and yeast, you have non-enveloped viruses, you see the difference between enveloped and non-enveloped. Then we have the multi-resistant bacteria, and here we have the tuberculosis bacteria, and if you watch to any uh, um, technical specs of a disinfectant, you want to see the TB, okay, because this is one of the most resistant multi microorganisms. On top of this, we have bacterial spores. These are bacteria, it would be too long to explain, but bacteria who didn't find nice conditions and they 
spore related. So they released an endospore in the environment, and for hundreds of years, it will stay in this kind of standby or sleep mode. Given good conditions, spores will grow again. So now we have different disinfection levels. The first level, typically for floors, this is enough. You want to watch and buy a product, a disinfectant, that will cover these three types of microorganisms. Then we have intermediate level, and this is the first step. We, we say, usually say decontamination, but to me this term, depending on the language, US or UK, it has a different meaning. Uh, in, my, in French, decontamination, it is a word that is uh, forbidden. It's either disinfection or cleaning, but decontamination is too vague in my country at least. So forgive me, I uh, beg your pardon, but I'm going to be more specific on that. So when we talk about pre-disinfection, uh, we want to reach a high level, intermediate level of disinfection. So basically you remove most of them with the exception of endospores. This is called the high level or cold sterilization uh, like chlorine or something like this. Now in numbers, again, it's not to, we have to face these figures. This is the number of microorganisms inside and outside our body. Where do we find them? In our intestines, obviously good ones, they digest our food. Then we have uh, on our skin, uh, I'll put a bar on billions, so it's thousand billions, it's easier to pronounce than trillions. Uh, and this is in the mouse. The mouse is not the cleanest, nicest place, uh, 10 billion on average. And of course, that's a fantastic place for bacteria to grow. Uh, you know better than me that plaque is a biofilm which has been built. And um, anyway, you know this better than me. Important, again, most of them are good to us. They, they support digestion, they prevent maybe other infections. But some of them are infectious pathogens. 100 million, typically streptococci or staphylococci. Now, recently I checked and uh, on uh, the coronavirus, um, they have done some, some measuring, some sampling. And uh, the highest virus load was after seven days of incubation. Okay? But still, after 25 days, uh, there are 160,000 copies of uh, this virus. In the air, and now you understand why we all wear masks, um, in shopping malls there are 4 million per square meter of air, so the more people, the higher the contamination. If you go on the streets, this is in Paris, Champs-Élysées, okay, below 100,000, and on the beach, in the forest, nice place to go for jogging, 50. You are at a far lower risk when you go jogging, practice sport outside the city, on the beach, in the forest. Um, I'm coming back to this study from the UK. On average, in a dental office, it's like 1,500 colonies uh, per cubic meter. It's like two or three people chatting in a small room. This is the level of uh, contamination. Why? Because humans pollute. Okay? Every human will release in the environment particles, and these particles contain germs. Believe it or not, every minute, depending if you are resting or if you are active, is from 100 to 5,000 microorganisms which are released into the environment. The more people, the higher the contamination. So it comes from schemes, peeling, and nasopharyngeal droplets. This is why people are asked to wear masks to prevent the spread of these uh, small droplets. Well, droplets, now we have to be clear on this. A droplet is a small saliva particle which is bigger than 50 microns, five zero, 50. Below 50, we call this aerosol. This is very important to understand. I'm gonna talk about filtration of masks to distinguish droplets and aerosol, very thin, very below one micron particles. When I lectured a couple of months ago, I, I checked a bit on the internet and uh, it was a big topic. And I sh saw this uh, from Japan. They had this guy sneezing and with high definition uh, cameras, they could pick the uh, droplets. So you see big ones. These are bigger than one 
one millimeter, so they will they will drop straight. But the small ones, you see, they will stay, they will fly around. They're going to be bounced around the area. And uh, you can find, um, you see here, you can find um, these aerosol, which travels uh, to a long distance. Believe it or not, up to 100 meters, depending on the airflow. But they will be there suspended in the air. Um, so if you are next to this person, you breathe air, you will inhale microorganisms. Now we have two guys talking. Okay, talking loud, <laughs> as Japanese can do, but um, you would see now. They talk, da, 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 and you can see also here, bigger droplets, they will drop and um, settle down. But smaller ones are suspended, extremely light. You see here. And as I mentioned, depending on the size, the diameter, it can go up to 100 meters. This is one person coughing. And here you have the timing, okay? Five minutes later, 10 minutes. So the atmosphere, the air is totally polluted. And you see these guys are gonna breathe air, which looks very nice, but they will inhale microorganisms from, from this person. Sneezing is like 40,000 droplets. Coughing is 500 to 1,000. Um, and talking loud would be less, but still, uh, I'm talking right now, and I'm sure my screen is full of small droplets because we just uh, exhale um, microorganisms. Infection, transmission modes. I mentioned before that you doctors, and I've noticed now uh, the measures which are put in place, you are really in front of the patient's mouth and you can catch infections. Uh, now, more than ever, we understood that it's extremely uh, dangerous. And so the first way is getting infected uh, with aerosol or splatter droplets. Okay? You can be directly injured. So it's a blood-to-blood -blood, uh, infection like hepatitis, HIV. It's blood-to-blood. -blood. It's not an airborne infection like uh, aerosol. You could be or you could infect your patients with non-properly uh, processed, sterilized instruments, especially the handpiece that goes, that enters the mouth. Hands and stuff. Most of the infections are transmitted by hands and stuff. We, we keep touching our face and, uh, you know, our hands are highly contaminated and we put these hands on our mouth, on our lips, and sooner or later we might catch something. So I'm gonna focus on these two, of course, reprocessing, uh, but insist on this. Back to my study before. This is a sampling on contamination very close to the patient's mouth, that's a one meter, and down to the feet, like two meters away from uh, the patient. Look at this graph. This is the colonies, 1,500. You know, colony is what you want to measure with the agar plate. You take a sampling, you incubate this plate, and these small dots are colonies. So when we talk about 1,500 colonies, for sure, one colony, which is meant to be, you know, issued by one bacteria, uh, can be for more. So it's at least 1,500. Anyway, important to see that during treatment, during drilling, scaling, you get four times more, and this is here, far away from the patient's mouth. This was sampling only for streptococci. So it confirms that it comes out of the patient's mouth. Short video to illustrate what I was just saying. Um, following on this, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to show you the um, what the handpiece does. Uh, just note that the doctor has not covered his nose. Okay. Bear in mind that around the dining chair, everything is contaminated. As we sh we've seen on the, in the video, remove what is not used during treatment. Remove everything from the bench or hide it inside the closed drawers because everything is going to be contaminated. You saw the burrs. Typically, you have these burrs which are close to the, um, 
to the doctor, uh, but the burrs are contaminated. So you either change the burrs between patients, but never reuse burrs or a holder which has been used by with a previous uh, previous patient. So this is proved by by literature. Now I want to show you. We have done tests in our company. Uh, we have compared how much aerosol is generated by a turbine versus a contrangle, an angle angled uh, angled piece. You know, the turbine is run with compressed air. So when you enter the mouth, you will pressurize the patient's mouth. And of course, everything will be sprayed around. The contrangle runs with a motor at a lower speed than the turbine. But still, you see, this is now uh, used turbine versus contrangle. This is a contrangle. This is a turbine. First thing, they run at different speed. This is the handpiece. And you can see it or not, but the, no, sorry, this was the turbine. This is the turbine, which generates more, far more, because they, they run at high speed. And again, they are run powered by compressed air. This is run with an electric motor, but still you have air for the spray and you see you have a bit less um, aerosol. The solution, efficient suction. You see the suction tip, it reduces the amount of, uh, of aerosol. Now, you have cheap turbines, you have more expensive ones. Uh, we have a special system that reduces the, the air emission. Again. And these are called the airborne infections. Whatever you breathe in and will enter your lungs and not only your lungs. This is why uh, we must wear a mask. I know it has been said before, but typically doctors use surgical masks. This is a European standard, one, two, one R, two R. And uh, very important to understand, to be honest, I have learned this too, because this is a one-way protection it will not protect the doctor, the wearer, but it will protect the patients from the doctor's microorganisms. Now, yes, it will, when you inhale, it will block droplets above 50 micron. So splashes, splatters, whatever, yes, containing germs. But in no way they will protect you, they will block airborne particles and the... Um, microorganisms below five micron. So whatever we saw before, uh, below 50 micron uh, is called aerosol. Therefore, and also because they don't offer a very nice fit, a tight fit, they do not provide a complete protection for you healthcare professionals, doctors and assistants. They will protect the patient, but not you. And in my country, I think most of doctors and most of dealers will sell surgical masks, you know, they cost less. Um, and now you have to switch to uh, FFP masks. Uh, they offer a tight fit and efficient filtration below 5 micron. So they protect the wearer. You, when you inhale, they will stop and block infectious agents and very tiny small viruses. That's three times, FFP1, 2, and 3. Again, it has been said, forget about FFP1, it filters around 80%, but FFP2, this is the minimum, it filters 94%. And this compares to the N95 US, so it filters 95%, or KN95, this is from China. Then you can also go to FFP3, which is a 99, which is a minimum, okay? It can be 98, 97, or above 99, this is then called FFP3 masks. With or without exhalation valve, uh, exhalation valve is quite nice because uh, breathing is not so so easy. So the problem is when you exhale your, your air, um, it will not filter. So basically the, uh, the patient will be, can be infected with your own microorganisms. Uh, I've read in the literature that uh, you might wear FFP mask with the exhalation valve, but then on top of it, you put uh, surgical masks. 
to me it's a bit it's a bit ridiculous so i would recommend using ffp2 minimum without exhalation valves now i lectured on reprocessing masks that's absolutely uh, forbidden we tolerated or many countries tolerated this procedure because there was a lack of masks so obviously what can i do the best thing was to reprocess my mask but it's a single use mask that you have to wear properly um, of course men with beard and moustache doesn't make it easy for tightness avoid to touch the filtration area the front of your masks press the clip now this is the right procedure and uh, very often we see this kind of stuff so you see the um, elastic was below the ear so it opens here away for you know air flows to the uh, easiest way so if you have an opening here if it's not tight you will breathe in non-filtered air and look at this i mean you must protect your nose because you you breathe in with your nose or even not knowing it you think you're breathing only with your mouth but we're usually breathing with both nose and mouth so this is absolutely uh, nonsense and puts you into 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 danger so never touch the filtration paper and in some guidelines we can see that to check the tightness they ask you to put your hands on the filtration paper to breathe in very strongly to check the tightness so I would not put my hands unless I've disinfected my hands. But if you're breathing very strongly, you know, sucking very fast, you can check the tightness of your of your mask. Now this is single use, and you must remove, change your masks maximum after three hours for um, surgical masks or six eight hours after continuous use this means you have not touched the mask you have not put your mask to your neck you have not it's not humid it has not been exposed to a high level of humidity so you use it and change it basically between patients and i know that most of you don't do that um i think it's not there that we should save money i mean this is really your own protection it protects you from uh, you see COVID, how infectious it is. You can you can get it very, very easily. Um, so once you have put it here, the first thing on your neck, you had splashes on your neck. So your neck is highly contaminated. So you would uh, like uh, dip your mask onto your neck and put it back to your face. What a mistake. Protect your eyes as well, very important. And also patient's mouth. Okay, you have uh, big goggles or ideal would be uh, uh, this shield, integrated shield. Hand hygiene has been talked a lot. Again, uh, decontamination to me is too vague. Now, there are two things. Obviously, I remove my gloves and my mask. And then two things. Shall I disinfect my hands or wash my hands? These are two different things. Uh, typically, when I remove my gloves, I disinfect my hands. This is like 90% of the world. I'm not running around the globe and, uh, of course, checking local procedure. And in some countries, they say you must wash. Why should I wash my hands if they are not dirty? So when you remove your gloves, inside your gloves, uh, you have sweat. So you have grown microorganisms on your hands. So what we have to, to do is to reduce the contamination with disinfection, using a hydroalcoholic solution properly. I wash my hands only if there's dirt, blood, if a glove is dirty, and obviously first thing in the morning, after lunch, after the toilet, this is obvious. If you wash too often your hands, you will dry off your hands, and you remove this uh, lipidic protection that we have. We have natural protection that prevents any, you know, infection coming from our skin. If you wash too often, Typically, with a lot of uh, cheap uh, economical soap and not a uh, neutral uh, soap, you will kill your hands. Now, you do whatever you want, uh, but this is the my recommendation. Um, avoid to disinfect your hands immediately after washing your hands, because first thing, your hands are not dry, so you're going to dilute the, the solution, which is not going to disinfect 
as much as it is supposed to. And you might also create some allergy uh, on your skin. So you wash your hands, you pet dry, don't scrub because you damage your hands, pet dry, wait for a few couple of minutes, and then you disinfect your hands. And then you put your first pair of gloves and you disinfect after removing gloves and before you put a new pair of gloves. Good. Now, the second part of the presentation is the reprocessing. It has been mentioned before by a doctor, and uh, I, I just say I'm, I'm a trained dental assistant. And what is nice when I'm alone with 40, 50 dental assistant, the doctor is not here, they just talk to me. You know, my doctor is asking me to do this and do that. So they're really free, not scared by the doctor. And then I I get the real world, how it really works in a little practice. And obviously for me, new topics, topics I will develop more because I see there's a concern. So reprocessing means you take a used and non-used, take everything you have on, on a tray, okay? You have used close to the patient mass, which has been spread with saliva. You take all these instruments, used and non-used, and you make them safe for reuse, reprocessing. This is the, uh, again, it has been said, this is a reprocessing area. Ideal would be in here, out there. This is the dirty area where disinfection and cleaning happens, and here we pouch and sterilize, out here. If you go, go back here, this area is heavily contaminated. Therefore, as mentioned before, the airflow should go from clean versus dirty. You either pressurize uh, the clean zone or you vacuum the dirty zone. Typically in hospitals, you have two separate rooms with a pass through washer, but let's keep our feet on earth. Uh, very often there's a very small, tiny area and one door. Still, and that's also one of my, part of my job, I can support you in redesigning, improving your reprocessing area. If we have one door, five square meters, we can get the best out of it. But if one day you build a, um, a building, I can give you good advice and please think of two doors. These are the steps. Okay, you remove uh, garbage and everything. And then you have um, what is called often decontamination. I say disinfection. This is the soaking uh, bath where pre-disinfection happens. I could lecture one hour only on disinfection, tell you. Then you rinse your instruments, you clean the instruments, you rinse again after cleaning. You have uh, nice to have some buffer areas to dry the instruments. In this area I would re um, maintain my hand pieces. And then you package, again, buffer storage before you put in a sterilizer. And again, here, an area where you can do the labeling, you can do traceability, you let them cool down before you take them out to storage or for reuse. Now, this is a funny picture. On the road of success, there are no shortcuts. What is meant here is that every step is important. And if I can, if, if I can convince you today on this, I will be the happiest. <laughs> because pre-infection, cleaning, and sterilization, these are the, um, the main steps. You cannot rush one, even worse, you cannot skip one. Uh, very often I, I hear that, oh, I don't clean because I'm gonna sterilize. Hang on, a sterilizer doesn't clean. Okay, there are three different uh, steps, three different techniques. Let's start with the first one. To me, this is the most important. Instruments must be soaked straight away after use, as soon as possible. Now, in some countries, I don't want to name the countries, they tell you soak into uh, enzymatic detergent. But sorry, this does not disinfect, it doesn't kill. Soap? cleans enzymes improve cleaning they don't kill anything so the purpose of this number one purpose is to prevent debris saliva blood whatever uh, from drying because obviously if you want to wash dried uh, remains stains forget it they're going to achieve the appropriate cleaning and very important we want we want to kill we have to start reducing the microbial load population on the instruments. And there's a good reason for this. It also prevents infection from staff. If, for example, you, you clean your instruments and you, you, you stitch, you get a stitch and you, you cut yourselves, and you have 
not disinfected, only washed, you're in trouble, aren't you? So now, uh, especially burrs, you know, burrs, they are still on the on the on the uh, turbine uh, burrs. To me, they are not soaked straight away. I recommend to doctors if you have a long procedure and you first start drilling, preparing a crown, take the burr, click, and drop them in this small tank. It will facilitate cleaning. If you need again, then take another one. That's it. But please take a few seconds to soak your your burrs. Now, what is the scope here? We expect an intermediate level of disinfection. I want to buy a product, I want to soak my instruments in a solution that guarantees the elimination of all these microorganisms. Wow. You have to select the right product. You know, sometimes it's nice to hear the sales reps, but sometimes they don't know what they are talking about. So say, guys, give me the instruction of use, give me the technical, um, technical uh, document. I want to show this because this is really complicated. It goes from one to 5% and from 15 minutes to 60. So now, hang on, what, what, what is the right selection? I want paracidal, I want bactericidal and uh, tubercularcidal. You remember, GB, tuberculosis is the most resistant. Now, if I select 3% for 15 minutes, see viruses, it says 1% 15. So I believe if I increase the concentration, it's going to be faster on viruses. Good. 3% 15 is good for bacteria. But here, hang on, it's not enough for um, multi-resistant bacteria. Two choices. I want to save money. I go for 30 minutes. I go for uh, 30 minutes. Or I go to 4% 15 minutes. And then I achieve the expected result. Okay, so don't make it too hot. It should be lukewarm. Uh, avoid liquids with aldehydes. They also fix the blood proteins. Um, I'm going to rush because I have time left. Cleaning. This is the second more important. Uh, you cannot sterilize non-clean instruments. And this shows you um, endo uh, burr. And here, use not clean and sterilize. So the, the sterilizer will not clean. A detergent is meant for cleaning. So here we use a detergent. It has foaming, emulsifying. Uh, it's a high-tech product. It, it will remove all the um, remains on the instruments. You can clean manually, but this is really uh, random because depending on the mood, on the experience, uh, how serious your stuff is, um, this is not the preferred choice. I would, uh, and uh, she or he must be really covered here because when you brush the instruments, you recreate this aerosol, which can be inhaled. So you see here, I would recommend that she switches to FFP2 masks. So you should go for ultrasonic cleaning. This is for me the second best um, ultrasonic cleaning, as we said before. And this is the top thermal waters. Of course, it's expensive, but this guarantees the best cleaning. Uh, these machines last for 15, 20 years, so it might be a smart investment. On the right-hand side here, this shows you the efficiency of the three techniques. When we talk about clean, it's not only visually clean, but you want to measure the residual protein level on the instruments. This is before cleaning, after manual cleaning, after ultrasonic cleaning, and after wash. You see here, this is much, much better. Packaging, I'm going to jump this because I want to talk about salvation. Um, I've never been to Pakistan. I would love to. Here, um, we talk about reduction to 10 to minus 6, which means you bring the uh, initial contamination from this high level down to 10 to minus 6. And to help this, it's not the autoclave only. You will have disinfection, which reduces the microbial population, cleaning, and then the autoclave. Uh, will achieve the last one. But still, it's never going to be zero. You bring it to a low number, but you will still have some survivors. So the better you do the first two steps, the closer to zero. Now, sterilization, uh, dried versus steam. So dried, forget it. It's forbidden in many countries because it's too hot. The holding time is too long, uh, and you cannot process uh, hand pieces versus steam that can process 
anything. And uh, okay, sorry, but I have to rush. Um, important is to have a good vacuum. If the autoclave does not pre vacuum the chamber, you can have air bubbles trapped inside hand pieces. And here inside, obviously, it's not going to be sterile. If you sterilize gross instruments, you have air pockets inside air. There is no steam, there is no uh, sterilization. Okay. And this is so called the B type cycle. B comes from big sterilizer, um, which does a very strong three step, three step pre vacuum. You see, it will remove 99.9 of the air. It guarantees steam penetration inside any, any instrument. It can be hollow, it can be porous, you can pouch, double pouch. So when you watch here, different type of cycles which are offered on a sterilizer, you're going to watch the B type cycle. This is the medical grade cycle. Now it's your choice. You switch from dry heat to steam. I mean, we have this machine which is called class S for specific uh, instruments and loads. You cannot do everything like a porous, uh, like a B type cycle, but this is, let's say, dental and this is surgical. Now you, uh, it's your choice. Okay. Storage, store in dry area, um, um, avoid high humidity, and you can store for, depending on the country, from uh, one to three months. This is my email address. I'm keen and very pleased to answer your emails. Um, you know, this is a very long, long topic, and uh, hopefully one day we can meet there and talk for a couple hours and provide you more details. So this is roughly basic of my knowledge and uh, the best I could offer you in a very short uh, time. So thank you for attending and uh, talking to you thank soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Sen, for being a part of this conference and for this wonderful session. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.